When you adapt a well-beloved TV series to the big screen, it's always a risk, and it sometimes, very rarely, can work. Star Trek The Next Generation was a very successful and popular series, and when the seventh season was still in production, they were already shooting the very first Next Generation film, Star Trek Generations, to be released very soon after the final episode was aired. In 1992, executives at Paramount proposed to Next Generation producer Rick Berman with the idea of creating a Next Generation feature film. Star Trek Next Generation writers Ronald D. Moore and Brannon Braga were asked midway through the sixth season of Next Generation to write the first draft of the film. They would spend weeks developing a story. Eventually, they completed the first draft of the screenplay. In the original draft, the whole original series cast was going to appear in the prologue. In the first scene, all the original series characters are crammed into an elevator aboard the Enterprise B. Berman felt very strongly that including the original crew would be a great way to pass the baton to the next generation cast. I think the, the, the most important things that we thought about doing was that this should not be, we should try not to make this Star Trek 7. We should try deliberately to make this Star Trek Generations, which meant that it was going to be the next generation's movie. Leonard Nimoy and DeForest Kelly were approached to appear in the film. They would decline the offer. Nimoy and Kelly felt they already made a proper goodbye in the last movie. Also, Nimoy, when he read the first draft of the script, thought Spock's dialogue and lines were too bland. He commented that if you took the dozen or so lines of Spock's dialogue and simply changed the name of the character, nobody would notice the difference. Nimoy was also offered to direct, but he declined. William Shatner, James Doohan and Walter Koenig would end up being the only original cast members to appear in Generations. Cast members of The Next Generation were not made aware of all of the original cast not appearing in the film. Patrick Stewart was said to be very excited to work with the original cast. He said he didn't want to sail into the future just as The Next Generation cast. One of the first ideas in the first draft of the script was having a scene of the Enterprise D's epic saucer crash, a scene which was originally going to be in the Next Generation six season finale episode, but Moore and Bragger decided to have the saucer scene crash in the film. Originally, they aimed to have Captain Picard killed off. That idea was dropped, so they decided that Kirk dying was the better option. Paramount and William Shatner had very few concerns about the plot point, and thought it was a great idea. Paramount had decreed that they weren't going to make any more movies with the uh, uh, older cast. Was, uh, this was a handing of the baton, as you say. I thought it was very dramatic and very good, uh, as we and I, and I was quite pleased with it. And then as we got to do it, I began to, the significance of it began to occur to me. And, and that was difficult. The budget constraints for the film was something scriptwriters Bragger and Moore had to think about when refining the script. The total budget was originally planned to be over 30 million, but after negotiations, the budget was reduced to 25 million. However, more money had to be spent to shoot Kirk's dramatic death scene. After Leonard Nimoy declined as director of Generations, the producers chose David Carson. He had no feature film experience, but they hired him, mainly because he had directed several episodes of Star Trek, including the popular Next Generation episode, Yesterday's Enterprise. Filming would commence Monday, March the 28th of 1994. Herman Zimmerman again would be hired as production designer. Zimmerman was a Star Trek veteran who had worked on the previous Star Trek films, The Next Generation, and Deep Space Nine. Transitioning from a television screen to a movie meant that sets and designs needed to be more detailed to stand up on the big screen. The film and the TV show, which was in its final season, was shot back to back on different sound stages on Paramount Studios' lot. They added an entirely new location on the Enterprise, stellar cartography. The script described the location of a small room with maps on one wall. Zimmerman decided to design a circular set to give the impression the actors are inside a star map. The set was made into one of the largest sets ever constructed on a Paramount lot. Scenes that did not feature the Next Generation crew were filmed first. Stage 7 
was where the Enterprise B's bridge, deflector room and corridors were built and filmed. The Enterprise B's bridge was a redress of the Enterprise A bridge from Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. The set was heavily modified to become the Amagosa Observatory Control Center. The Enterprise D bridge was redesigned and was inspired by the alternate history bridge of the Enterprise D from the Next Generation episode Yesterday's Enterprise. Some of the other modifications made to the bridge was the raised command platform, which was originally made for the future Enterprise design in the final two-part episode, All Good Things. The holodeck scenes were filmed on board the ship, Lady Washington, which was a full-scale replica of one of the first American sailing ships. The scenes at Captain Kirk's house and farm in the Nexus were actually shot at William Shatner's house. Captain Kirk's unseen love interest in the Nexus, Antonia, was originally conceived as being Carol Marcus from Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. Industrial Light and Magic did the majority of the special effects. Generation's special effect jobs were split between the television show's effects team and ILM. The Enterprise D crash scene was filmed mid-May of 1994. This epic scene was among the last remaining shots of the film before the existing Next Generation sets were demolished. The main reasons for the destruction of the Enterprise was that the ship was designed for low resolution and the narrow aspect ratio television screens. Destroying the ship allowed the creation of a theatre-friendly ship. Most of the sets of the Enterprise were destroyed. What was not destroyed was crew quarters, transporter rooms and parts of engineering, which were made up into sets for the TV show Star Trek Voyager. After the end of the show, there was only six months before the film was scheduled to be released in theatres to make way for the newly planned TV series Star Trek Voyager. Director David Carson would get Star Trek Generations finished on time and under budget, except the ending had to be reshot. Writers Ronald D. Moore and Brandon Bragger were asked to come up with an ending. They came up with a number of scenarios. They settled with having a bridge collapse and provide an action sequence with Captain Picard, Captain Kirk and Soren. The scaffolding sets were rebuilt at the Valley of Fire, Nevada. The 65-foot bridge was flown in by helicopter. Bragger and Moore were disappointed with how the ending turned out, even though many fans believed it was better than Captain Kirk being shot in the back. There were many scenes deleted. One deleted scene showed Soren using a nanoprobe to stop and start LaForge's heart. The original opening in the movie didn't just show a champagne bottle drifting in space. In the deleted scene, the bottle would be intercut with shots of Chekhov and Scotty looking for something in the sky. We then see Kirk orbital skydiving and landing when Chekhov reminds him that they are scheduled to attend the christening ceremony for the Enterprise B tomorrow. Kirk replies that he's not attending. Whoopi's character, Guinan, mentions in the film the destruction of her homeworld by the Borg. The first time she mentions her home planet's destruction by the Borg was in the Next Generation Season 2 episode, Q Who. Generations would be the last time Geordie LaForge is shown wearing the visor. He receives new cybernetic implants in the second Next Generation film, Star Trek First Contact. Actor Alan Ruck was cast as Captain John Harriman. He plays the same character in the Star Trek fan film called Star Trek of Gods and Men. Whoopi Goldberg makes an uncredited appearance as Guinan. Barbara March and Gwyneth Walsh play the villainous Cleon sisters, Lursa and Bertor. They are reoccurring characters in the fourth season episodes, Redemption Parts 1 and 2, and the seventh season episode, Firstborn. They would also appear in the episode of Deep Space Nine called Past Prologue. Tim Russ, who plays Tuvok in Star Trek Voyager, appears as a different character in a small part of the film as a member of the Enterprise B bridge crew. Russ also played a mercenary, Devore, in the sixth season episode of The Next Generation titled Starship Mine. In the original version of the ending, Captain Kirk dies when Sauron shoots him in the back. Sauron then dies when Captain Picard shoots him with his own disruptor pistol. It was decided to kill Kirk falling off a bridge. Malcolm McDowell later commented, they gave him such a lousy send-off. I mean, what a cheesy move, he falls off a bridge. 
I shoot the bridge, and he falls. And that's the best idea they could come up with? McDowell even received death threats from obsessed Star Trek fans because his character killed Captain Kirk. After the fans' negative reaction to the death of Kirk, Shatner would write a Star Trek novel which was titled The Return, in which Romulans and the Borg form an alliance and bring Kirk back to life using Borg nanotechnology and turn him against Picard and the crew of The Next Generation. Dennis McCarthy was hired as the composer for the score. He was known for scoring TV scores for Star Trek The Next Generation and other well-known TV shows. The score for Generations is one of the most underrated scores in the Star Trek universe, and the score has many memorable moments in it. The Star Trek Generations marketing included a website, which would be the first site on the internet to officially promote a film. The site was very successful and was viewed over a million times worldwide. This was a time when very few people had internet access. Star Trek Generations was released on November the 18th of 1994 and grossed $23.1 million during the opening weekend. It was the highest grossing film during the first week of its release in the US, and it stayed in the top 10 for four weeks. The film made over $42 million worldwide. The film had very mixed reviews. One reviewer said that despite a reasonably original storyline, familiar characters, first-rate special effects, and the hallmark meeting between Captains Kirk and Picard, there's something very dissatisfying about the movie. The problem is that too often, it seems like little more than an over-budgeted double-length episode of the Next Generation television series. Roger Ebert also commented on the film's unimaginative script and complained that the starship can go boldly when no one has gone before, but the screenwriters can only do vice versa. Star Trek Generations was a bit of a risky exercise one way to guarantee the film's success was to have three original series members from the old crew pass the baton on to the new crew for cinema audiences to embrace. And they also had the success of the television series to rely on. The whole Nexus story arc was clever and Malcolm McDowell made a great villain and he has some memorable lines throughout. Patrick Stewart is fantastic as usual and gives a great performance. The film has its many good points. The crash scene of the Enterprise is epic. The film excluding Data and Picard doesn't give much for the rest of the cast to do. Brent Spiner is always great as Data. He does some funny and at times cringeworthy scenes. He provides the main comedy in the film thanks to the emotion ship, which causes his emotions to go all over the place, even making him cry yellow tears as he finds his cat Spot in the wreckage of the Enterprise. Captain Kirk dying was a big negative for a lot of people. It didn't bother me, but what bothered me is the way Kirk got killed off in such a mediocre way. Star Trek Generations wasn't really the next generation film I was hoping for. In regards to the next generation, I much rather prefer the TV series, which to me is far more superior than the movies. My name's Jonathan, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and like what you see on my channel, please subscribe and if you would like to become a patron on my Patreon, click on the link below.